Hello everyone, my name is Katie. I'm with Little Angel Service Dogs, and I'm here today to give you a presentation and an explanation of how dogs are able to alert to seizures. This is something that I get asked quite a bit. Little Angel Service Dogs is a leader in the industry as far as actively training dogs to alert to seizures. Whereas for years, most organizations would place dogs who had the type of personality, leaning towards propensities that would have the dog naturally alert to seizures, but there was no way that people knew how dogs were actually picking up on them and so they had no way to actively train them. I've been training seizure alert dogs for over 20 years. When I first began, they were seizure response dogs. So these dogs were trained to perhaps help their person rise after they had fallen from a seizure. They help to calm the person. They may go retrieve a cell phone, medication, water. Perhaps they would go get someone else after the seizure occurred. After years of working with these dogs, I started to realize that the dogs who alerted usually had the same type of personality, which was generally anxious in demeanor these are the same dogs who would suffer from separation anxiety because they were so bonded with their handler that when they were left alone, they would become very distraught. But these dogs would be perfect to naturally alert to seizures because they had a few things going for them already. So in order to understand how we're actively training dogs to alert to seizures, it's important to understand the background and how dogs have been naturally alerting to seizures forever. Several factors have to come into play for a dog to naturally alert to seizures. First of all, they have to have a very close bond with the person that has the seizures. In addition to that, the dog should have an anxious personality. So this dog is a little bit stressed out just by personality and demeanor. And so these are the types of dogs who care when a stressful event happens. In order for the dog to care about the seizure, the seizures have to be mostly distressful in nature. So if someone is having a petite mal seizure or an absent seizure, something that's not very stressful to anyone in the home or to the individual having it, the dogs wouldn't care either. What we're looking for is that that person would typically have grand mal seizures or what we call tonic-clonic seizures. It just has to be stressful so the dog would care. In addition, the patients would have to have the types of seizures that build slowly in their brain before showing any clinical signs of the seizure. Some people have the types of seizures that strike very, very quickly, and it doesn't give the dog any type of a prompt, so the dog isn't able to realize that the seizure is about to happen. But if this is a patient who has seizure activity that builds, and then the physical signs of the seizure are displayed, the dog does have something to go off of. So as far as the dog is concerned, the seizure has started before the physical signs of the seizure are present. So you could be looking at this person and talking to them, and the dog is over here alerting to the seizure and showing some stress behaviors, which would help you clue in that the person is about to have a seizure, even though you see nothing different in the person directly and even though they don't feel any different. Of course, some people do have an aura before they have a seizure, but that's not exactly what the dog is picking up on. One other thing that we learned had to happen was that this person could not have seizure activity randomly throughout the day, otherwise those symptoms or the cue would be available to the dog, but then no physical signs of the seizure or no stressful event would actually happen. So when we put all of these things together, what we're seeing is that the dog starts to show stress behaviors right before the seizure occurs. And this allows the patient or other people in the environment to see that the seizure is about to happen. My name is Andy Watt. I'm 18 years old. I'm from Bishop, California, and Addison is my seizure service dog. She works with me to alert to my seizures before they're gonna happen. So Andy was diagnosed with epilepsy uh, about the sixth grade. He's a senior in high school now. 
Um, he has seizures just about every day. Uh, our first day of handler training out at the ranch, uh, we were there for uh, maybe an hour. She pawed at, at Andy, and so uh, the, the trainer uh, put him down to relax and said, you know, how do you feel? And he, he said he felt okay, but about a minute later he had a seizure, and so they did the deep pressure therapy, and, and uh, it was definitely a mild seizure, so it helped Andy to, we think, I think, helped Andy get through the seizure with less stress. and and uh, he's able to continue the training the rest of the day. But yeah, it was amazing that uh, the very first day there to see that this could actually happen. If I hadn't seen it myself, I don't know if I would have believed it, but, uh, and then it's happened twice since then. It was super big and super important in my entire family just to know that what we worked for and raised money for is it's right there and it was so quick too. That was just awesome. And for Andy now with, with Addy, uh, it's as much for me and my wife and our family to give Andy the independence that he needs as an 18-year-old senior in high school and going on to college. It just relieves a lot of stress on me when he goes out that I know that he's got somebody, uh, Addy, with him to, to help him through the tough times. And then for Andy, I think it's, it's just emotionally that he knows there's always somebody there that's going to be focused on him and take care of him all the time. Um, I'm a senior in high school, so that's really big for me to have that independence and the ability to kind of be out on my own. And so she's been a really big help to me. And so um, do you think Addison will go to prom this year? I don't know. I know she'll help me get to prom. Uh, yes, she will. I mean, it's fantastic to be able to have that independence. And we, you know, it's totally worth the wait because just the feeling I've gotten in the last 10 days with her, I'll never, I mean, that is just so awesome to feel that. And it's totally, like I said, it's so worth the wait. Yeah, this is gonna be a huge for, not just for Andy, but for me and my wife and my family. I did a lot of research into programs for, for service dogs. And the reason I picked Little Angels was because of Katie and her program. And, you know, they have a, their hearts in it for the right reason. And they all they care about is getting the dog to the right people. And, and it's critical for these, families that our lives are being changed by by getting the service dogs. From the dog's perspective, certain things are happening all in a row. After the dog has been with this person for a period of time, they've grown attached to the person, they recognize that stressful events happen, which are the seizures, and then the dog realizes that a certain cue is available before the stressful event, and this is something that always happens and we know now that it is scent that the dogs are picking up on. If you were to ask me two years ago how I knew this, I would tell you that it was because of my experience. I have seen firsthand after training dogs to alert to scent that this is what they're picking up on. But just recently in Europe, there was a study done, a peer-reviewed study that proved that dogs can smell seizures. So over time, the dog realizes that this scent is available before the stressful event, and then the dog would start showing signs of stress behavior. And this could be minutes or seconds before the seizure actually happens. Stress behaviors in dogs can present themselves like a dog staring at the person. It could be that the dog is climbing up on the person's lap. The dog could be barking at them. The dog could be pawing at them. The dog could be pacing back and forth. There could be whining involved. So much of the time, it's very obvious signs that the dog is having some stress, but in other dogs, it's going to be less noticeable. The dog might be yawning or licking its paws, maybe barely putting its ears back. The dog could be leaving the room. And so if I had seizures and 20 minutes before every seizure, my dog yawned, I may never clue into the fact that my dog is telling me a seizure is about to happen. But if it were something more obvious, like the dog coming right up into my face and staring at me, and this is a behavior that doesn't normally happen any other time, I'm gonna put two and two together, and I'm going to understand that the dog is trying to tell me that a seizure is about to happen. I like to use some different examples and different scenarios to make this easier to understand. Let's use a dog who really loves going on car rides. And in the beginning, when this dog came into the owner's home, they didn't realize right away that the keys had anything to do with going for a car ride. Dogs are not going to think, 
Well, the keys are needed to start the ignition. For the dog, the owner picking the keys up off the counter really is not related to going on the car ride until the keys are picked up every time consistently before they get in the car. So in the very beginning, the keys being picked up off the counter meant nothing to the dog. They were not excited in any way whatsoever. But through repetition and consistency, the dog started to realize that the keys are a prompt that they're about to go on a car ride. And so this dog would start jumping and spinning in circles and getting really excited when the keys are picked up. This would be just like the scent that is available when the seizure activity begins before the physical or clinical effects of the seizure are present. So because the dog is stressed by the actual seizure, they realize the scent is available just like the keys were picked up right before the event and then they start to show signs at the exact time that the scent is available to them. But something else could happen with that dog. What if the owner started randomly picking up the keys throughout the day, but did not go and get in the car? The dog would likely stop caring about the keys being picked up because it does not necessarily mean that they are going to be going for that very exciting car ride. Now, the same thing is happening with the patient that has seizure activity building in their brain, the scent is available to the dog, but then the seizure activity goes away before the clinical signs of the seizure are visible. So with those patients, the dog may never care about the scent or they could care about it initially, but then learn to start ignoring the scent because for the dog, they're thinking the scent does not necessarily mean that the seizure is going to happen. Now, like I said earlier, a lot of organizations are specifically choosing dogs that get very, very attached to someone and who are anxious by personality and demeanor. They match the dog as a seizure response dog, trained to do a lot of tasks to assist with seizures, but the dog was never actively trained to alert. And everybody hopes that the dog is going to be able to naturally alert. Of course, there are going to be some things involved that is patient specific and it really has nothing to do with the dog and it's nothing that the dog can control. It's nothing that the owner can control. Um, the organization can't control it. It's just a hope that all of these things are going to conveniently all string together for this dog to naturally alert. But when I realized that dogs were picking up on some type of a cue, I thought, man, I've got to figure out what that cue is because we could really help a lot of people and get the dogs understanding seizure alert before the dog is actually placed with the recipient. For years, what we were doing is we were just matching dogs with the recipients who had these personality traits, hoping that the dog was going to be anxious and bonded enough with this person that they would show some very obvious stress behaviors, thus, alerting the handler or family members that the person is about to have a seizure. But then we started doing something a little bit different because we weren't really sure what it was that the dogs were picking up on at the time, but we knew that there was something. The dog knew in some way that the seizure was about to happen. So what we started to do is we wanted to train the dogs to care about the seizure. We wouldn't necessarily have to get an anxious dog, but we would have to get a dog who really loved food. And so what we would do is we would make sure that the dog got a jackpot of treats every time the seizure happened. That's gonna make them care about the seizure. So if they're not anxious about it, we're gonna get them excited about it one way or another. But then we had to make sure that the dog was going to show a very specific behavior so that we didn't have to rely on the fact that the dog is maybe going to gaze at them, maybe it's going to bark, maybe it's going to pace. And so what we started to do was to train the dog to paw at our leg on command to get a series of treats. And we call this the alert game because the dog loves this interaction and they cannot wait for it to happen. When the recipient would come and get their dog, we would show them how to play the alert game with their dog, but we would instruct them to only play it after 
they knew they had a seizure. And even better would be if we could get someone else in the home to play the alert game during that person's seizure. Then all we had to rely on was repetition and consistency. So eventually we did have dogs placed with recipients who would alert to the seizure either during or preferably before. Sometime later, we thought, let's see if it's scent that the dogs are picking up on. And the way that we did this training was very much like how dogs are trained to find drugs or guns or victims or perpetrators or bed bugs or cancer or diabetes. Our dogs are trained just like all these other dogs have been trained for so many years, but we are using the scent of the seizure to train the dog to give us an alert behavior. What we started to do is we would have our recipient swab the inside of their mouth and the palms of their hands with some clean gauze right after they had a seizure. They would put it in a Ziploc bag and they would mail it off to our organization. And then we would very secretly present the scent to the dog at the same time that we are playing the alert game. So essentially what would happen is we would have a container that opened very silently in our pocket or in our treat bag and we would open it and then seconds later we would start telling the dog to alert basically to paw at our leg and the dog would get a series of treats. The dog thought this was amazing and then we would close that container really quietly. The reason that we were being really secretive about how to present that scent is we didn't want the dog to associate the visible cue of seeing the scent container or the audible cue of hearing the container open to play the alert game. All we wanted was the olfactory cue. So we wanted them to smell it and then realize this smell is always available when we play the alert game. It might be a month or so of playing this game with the dog consistently before they realize that the scent is a cue but we will be working with the dog we will open up that scent container and then the dog will paw at our leg without us asking them to do so when we place those dogs with the recipient a handful of them are able to alert to seizures in advance the first time they ever see one in their recipient but most of the dogs have to have it reinforced before they fully understand this concept the reason that they have to have it reinforced is that this person who has the seizures, it might be building slowly, the scent might be available very slowly to them, and it's also a fresh new scent, and it's real life. This is what's really happening in real time. It's not in a training scenario, it's not on a piece of gauze, it's not an older scent, it's brand new and it's coming at them very naturally. So a lot of the dogs do have to have their recipient play the alert game with them real time, either having someone else play it during the seizure or the recipient themselves, the person who has the seizure, would play the alert game with the dog as they're recovering from the seizure. But we found that the dogs were able to pick up on this training leagues before the dogs who went with this old training method. And when I say that it's leagues before, I want you to understand that before the dogs started having scent training, it would take perhaps months for the dogs to understand the repetition and the consistency of the actual seizure happening for them to understand what they're supposed to be doing. But with the scent training with the gauze and in our training environments, we were able to repeat it so regularly that the dog started picking up on it days after being placed with their recipient instead of months later. So right away we knew it was sent. There was no other way that the dogs would be able to do this. The first dog that ever did alert to the seizure in advance, the first time they ever experienced it with their recipient, this recipient was at handler training and they were going through a practice of having their dog go across the room to dial an assistance dog phone. The assistance dog phone is a really neat device that can just plug into a regular phone jack but with the touch of a dog's paw, the speed dial button is going to dial a lot of different phone numbers all in advance. It's a very valuable tool if we have an adult who is living by themselves because the dog can call for help 
when the recipient is unable to do that. This is a type of seizure response training. So the recipient was telling the dog dial, the dog was going away from them, going to dial the phone, coming back and being rewarded for it. And this happened a series of times, but then one time the dog stopped, came and sat in front of them and pawed at their leg. And the trainers all just kind of looked at each other, like what is going on? Just, you know, send the dog again. The dog is just confused about the cue that we're giving them. Well, the recipient gave the cue again, but the dog didn't move. It just sat there and pawed at her leg again. And then eight minutes later, she had a seizure. And I mean, just talking about it now, I have goosebumps, but I remember at the time how thrilled we were. It was just such evidence to us that this dog learned exactly what to do in a training environment, just specific to reenacting the scent for the recipient and they understood that and then acted on it the very first time. Handler training continued for that recipient and the next time they were at an amusement park, they were walking along with their dog and the dog tried to do this really awkward like three-legged walk while they were trying to paw at the handler's leg. Well, this time the trainer said, let's just go find a bench and sit down just in case. And it's a good thing they did because again, eight minutes later, she had a seizure. Since that time, we've had multiple dogs that were able to alert the very first time. But again, I just wanna be clear that most of the time, there needs to be some reinforcement. Let's fast forward years later, and we have come up with an even faster way to teach the dogs to alert. So what we do currently is we will still ask for the scent sample after the recipient has had a seizure. So we're asking for that gauze that they swab the inside of their mouth with in the palms of their hands, they still seal it up in a Ziploc bag and they still mail it off to our facility. But we are also asking them for several other scents. We ask them for scents taken when they are sure they have not had a seizure and it could be after they had been resting or sleeping. It could be after they've eaten. It could be after exercise. We ask for a lot of different types of scents based on different times of the day. And what we do is we start off with just two buckets and we will have the seizure scent in one bucket and then we will have a scent sample of the trainer that the dog is working with and we just stand there right in front of the dog and we use a little clicker and a clicker is a training device that we use that just makes a quick little click sound like every time you push on it and the dog has already been trained to associate that click with the right behavior and they know that they're going to get a treat for it well the dog walks over to these two buckets and they show interest in the bucket because they haven't seen them out before. And when the dog puts its nose to the correct bucket, we click and we treat. Well, after doing this for maybe five minutes, the dog starts to clue into the fact that one of the buckets is special. Then what we'll do is we will swap the buckets. So we will take the seizure scent and we will take the trainer scent, but we just move the buckets over. So now they're in a different position. Sometimes the dog will still go to the scent that maybe is on the dog's left, but the dog learns pretty quickly that we're going to ignore it and they're only going to get that click and treat when they go to the bucket that has the correct scent sample. After the dog clearly understands that it's the right scent that they're supposed to be going to, we add a third bucket and then we add a fourth bucket and then we add a fifth bucket. And all of these buckets have different scents and again, some of those are now the trainer and some of those are the recipient, just not where they've had a seizure. And the dog is able to detect which bucket is the correct bucket in the lineup, the one that has the seizure scent, and we give them the click and the treat. After they're able to determine that, we wait to give the dog the treat until they come to us and paw at our leg, and then we give them the treat. So after the dog understands this concept, we take that scent sample and we put it in a very small container. We put it in our treat bag and we will walk around with the dog, open it up and guess what? When the dog picks up on that scent, they paw at our leg. In this way, we're able to teach the dog that it's not just the scent of the recipient that's important, but it is the scent of the seizure that's important. And it just helps them to be able to distinguish it in their mind. Dogs are just so, incredible sometimes the things they do it seems like a miracle it seems like magic 
it's really science and the way that they're designed to be able to distinguish all of these scents so much better than we can. A dog's nasal cavity is designed to be able to hold different scents and all those different cavities and then the olfactory center in their brain is enormous when you compare it to that of a human's. Dogs can smell so many times stronger than we can that someone could come in the room and say, hey, what's that scent? I might not even be able to pick up on it. A dog was able to pick up on it maybe miles away. It's just incredible. So all we're really doing is we are relying on this gifted ability that dogs have and we are teaching them to show us a very specific behavior when that smell is available. And again, it's just the way that dogs have been trained to alert to diabetes and trained to alert to bed bugs in a hotel or termites in a wall or cancer in different patients. We're just lucky enough that we were able to hone in on what it is that these dogs can do. There are so many people who have been touched by the incredible ability of these dogs. There is a book uh, called After That Day, Stories of Epilepsy, and there are some stories in here of dogs that are able to alert to seizures, which are really great. Um, it's a book that's available on Amazon if you wanna take a read through that. And then we also have a book, A Guide to Training Your Own Seizure Assistance and Alert Dog. This is written by me, Katie Gonzalez. This is also available on Amazon, but I will say that the best part about the book is that it is teaching you how to train an actual assistance dog. It does go over step-by-step step how to train seizure alert dogs, but you've already heard that in this video. So if you aren't looking for an assistance dog that goes with you into public, you could easily just use this video and train your own dog at home to alert to seizures in the same way, and then you don't have to purchase a thing. Our greatest goal is that you are able to know before a seizure happens and dogs are an incredible, magical way to see that that's going to happen. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Our website is littleangelsservicedogs.org. And for now, I would like to show you some videos of some of our previous recipients who have received these dogs and their stories of the amazing ways that these dogs have changed their lives. Uh, I just met my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Dex would stop about midway through to do the task and look me dead in the eye. And he did that probably twice or three times. Twice, twice. Um, and then after he was done with his tasks, um, Josh put him into a down stay. Before he went into the down stay, he pawed at my leg and I had a seizure like three or four minutes after that. And then he pawed me again. We're like, oh, maybe he just wants more treats. Um, but then a couple minutes later, I had a seizure again. And something that I noticed was that when you were doing that, all of a sudden he just gave you an intense look in your eye again. He was just like staring straight at you. And then he pawed her. And we were wondering, well, is it, it can happen where she'll have a seizure after a seizure in a short time. And sure enough, he was alerting once again. He wasn't just asking for treats, but he was alerting once again. Everything that he's been trained to do, he actually did it. Yeah. yeah. So it was very awesome. Well, it's, yeah, it's just been absolutely amazing to see what going into it was just a dog, to, to see Dex just, just perform, it's just, it's just amazing. Um, just the, what he's been able to, to do, and how he's been trained, and how Natalie's been able to just latch on, and Dex and Nat have just been awesome together, and just to see that bond, uh, and just to see how Dex is gonna help Natalie, so it's pretty awesome, it's pretty awesome. Cool to see him go from scent training with a, with a scent in a little bottle, and then seeing him in action with her alerting every time. It's just amazing and it's overwhelming and this is why I do what I do. <laughs> too Far beyond what I expected. Just watching everything that we've seen go into action has been like overwhelming. And um, we are very, very thankful and just grateful for everybody that has a hand in Little Angels. People that donate to Little Angels. Thank you. Yeah, he alerted. Um, he's been alerting like right from the start. He's been alerting to Natalie's seizures, um, and so yeah, just the other night he alerted 13 minutes in advance. Um, and again, just to see, see that happen is just just amazing. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who helped raise Dex and train him. Um, he's perfect for me. Well, now he's your dog. Yay! <laughs> Sorry. I'm John. I'm Shyla, and this doggy right here, this good boy, he brought us here. Um, he is trained to alert to our son's seizures. Trevin has had epilepsy for three, three years. And <laughs> he was three, three when he was diagnosed with epilepsy. We were up to 10 to 20 seizures a day. It's the worst feeling in the world. It is. You feel completely hopeless. Um, there's n or helpless too. Like there's there's nothing that you can do to help him. Um, you just have to watch it and write it out. And it is seriously, I think the worst feeling that I've ever felt in mm. my entire life. Yeah. Scariest too. Then when we got the diagnosis, it was it was one of those things of we were wanting to to find the, the problem, solve it, and then we can move on. And then uh, we found out it was genetic, so there was nothing we could do about it. So we're just kind of uh, medicating. <clears throat> they started out and they were all day long. They were random. Um, and just sporadic all day, all night. Um, and then they got, so they're just at night now. <laughs> Thank you.
I think that Aiden comes in with a big help on, on the, he helps with the anxiety and the relief. And, mm -hmm. um, giving us a peace of mind, that's, that's a lot of it right there. Um, that's the biggest thing I've, I've discovered, mm -hmm. is the peace of mind that he brings. Now that Aiden has been with us just even these few days, um, my anxiety towards Trevin, it has gone down like yeah. tons. <laughs> and, um, because I, I'm always like anxious and just waiting for the next one to hit. And we have a video monitor on him when he sleeps and everything else. And usually I am like crazy, crazy about that monitor is on and it like right next to me. And since Aiden has been with us, like I have been so much more calm and just able to handle things a lot better. I don't have the monitor right next to me. What? I even noticed last night, I didn't even turn it on right away. I mean, like, it was, it's, it's crazy huge. You know, honestly, it help, uh, hopefully it gives him more confidence and it, it pulls him out. Because more independence. More independence. Allow him to be a kid, not have mom and dad hovering all the time, because um, he hates that. Um, just a sense of calm around the house, I think. Not so much of the anxiety, so much of the always constant worry and... Where's Trevin? Where's Trevin? But yeah, I think just overall the sense of calm yeah. and peace for the whole family. Yeah. For the whole family. It really is. Yeah. yeah. You know, hopefully he's like, can look at Aiden and be like, I get him all the time. This is my best friend and I'm just happy constantly. Hi, my name is Colleen Stewart. I am here for my mobility dog at Little Angels. Hi, I'm Greg Stewart, Colleen's husband, and this is a life-changing opportunity for us here. We, we can't be more grateful to the, the guys, the whole team at Little Angels and all the fosters for doing such a great job with Denny. He's, uh, he's within two weeks, actually on the first day, he was immediately part of our family. And uh, I, I've seen an immediate change in Colleen's health and psychologically and physically over the last two weeks. It's, this is a really great opportunity for us. Look at how fast I'm walking, right? Does it feel good holding on to him? It feels excellent. It's just, I feel safe. Denny is going to enable me to take a walk down the street three times a day and give me the exercise that I haven't been able to have. It's going to help my health um, so much with my oxygen and my exercise and muscles and it's, it's going to change my life completely. Well, I go to sea for a living and that means I'm gone for at least two and a half months at a time. And uh, for the last five years, I've been very concerned with Colleen's well-being when I was away at sea. And now I don't have to worry about that anymore because Denny's there with her. If she has any issues, he'll, he'll dial 911 and get EMS services there Im immediately and help her get exercise and get healthy. So it's, this is a life changer for me too, not just Colleen and her health issues, but my, my peace of mind has really, really been a big help. It's a long, long wait to get your dog but it's worth every single minute when your dog improves your life as much as Denny has for me. The people who trained him are miracle workers and have done an unbelievable job with my boy. It's the most wonderful thing and Little Angel Service Dogs has created it for me and everybody else that gets one of their dogs. Hello, my name is Katie and this is Loki. He's my little angel. He is a very special dog. He was not bred. He was actually rescued from a shelter because somebody gave up on him and didn't want him. So little angels came along and adopted him and trained him up. And he was 
meant for me. I have been waiting for five years for this little fella to come along and be rescued and trained. And I'm grateful that he was found because he's going to be my best buddy and my little helper. What would you say your life was like before you got Loki? I was very lonely and just full of solitude. I would spend every day alone in my bedroom, um, not interacting with family. I don't have any friends because of it. <laughs> Everybody that I know is online and in different countries. So it's just very, very lonely and very frightening and very sad. <laughs> How was it when you needed to go run errands? What would you do? It was impossible unless I had one of my parents with me, which is pretty embarrassing for somebody my age. Um, that or I didn't go. Uh, I did a lot of shopping online. That's where I got all of my stuff. Or I did grocery shopping through apps where I would go drive there and pick it up and not get out of my car. Would you have like moments of anxiety? Oh goodness, yes. All the time, every day. A day did not go by where I did not have anxiety, where I was just terrified to death. Sometimes I would wake up in the middle of the night just stricken with sheer terror. I would not know what was going on. And they would last two to three hours where I was just in this, this panic. It's a long time. It, yes, it, it is. Very long time. And the time would just drag by. Exhausting. It was. Very exhausting. And it's just... I didn't want to live that way anymore. And sometimes I would get to the point where I just wouldn't, didn't want to go on because it was just miserable. Yeah. I'm glad you don't have to anymore. No. <laughs> you got some glad. help. <laughs> very glad. Very glad. I'm not alone anymore. Huh. How has he helped you since you've started handler training two weeks ago? Oh gosh, um, he's just been a great help. I have um, I have something to focus on other than all of the things that are going on in my brain, that right. nonstop just chatter that's in my brain that I focus on 24 seven. I have somebody else to be responsible for and to make sure that they're okay. And in doing that, he helps me. Um, the deep pressure therapy that he's trained in has really helped. Yeah. He's doing it right now. Yeah. He, <laughs> you know, he climbs up on my lap and those anxiety attacks calm down in about 20 minutes, which is As just... opposed to three hours. Yes. Huge difference. Yes. Some of the big things that are really different with her is she's interacting with people now. And in the past, she didn't do that at all. Uh, she wouldn't go to her niece's birthday parties or family celebrations or anything because of her anxiety and just being around people. And since she's been here, she uh, after a week of her training <clears throat> and working with her dog, she actually went to the meet and greet, your Christmas meet and greet, and stayed for the whole thing with Loki underneath and by her side. That was just a, an amazing change for her in relatively short time frame. Uh, it's it's been I, I see lots and lots of differences in just this two weeks time frame. What are some of the things you're looking forward to doing with Loki when you get back home? Oh gosh, the number one thing on my list is going to a grocery store by myself and actually leaving with groceries. <laughs> yeah, that's important. <laughs> <laughs> Not going in and getting scared out of my wits and turning around and leaving. Or having little old ladies walk me back to my car. That happened one time. The last Aww. time I tried going to a grocery store by myself, world's biggest panic attack. Some little old lady stopped me and asked me if I was okay. Burst into tears, said no. Asked if she could walk me to my car. So, had a little old lady help me. <laughs> now you got a little, little no, no. Loki. You got a little Loki <laughs> now, huh? I just want to tell everybody that is struggling with psychiatric disabilities don't give up there's hope um and you're not alone there are so many people out there like us that have these disabilities and with them being hidden it's so much harder because you feel even more alone so just don't give up and one day you'll get your little angel and your life will change dramatically 
my message to everybody out there waiting. So just don't give up. It'll happen. My name is Julia Ankeny and this is my new service dog Opal. I have been waiting for about two and a half years to be placed and we are just finishing up our handler training here in San Diego so it's been much anticipated but she's she's been a dream. <laughs> the moment that Jen walked in with Opal I I'm sure I've just had the dumbest look on my face. I mean I was so excited and I cried a little bit. I was I didn't know how to react. I was like happy laughing. I'm sure I sounded crazy and it was just it's just seeing her for the first time and and knowing and I think I asked them I said is that my dog is that that one's for me and it was just um incredible and I uh I can't explain the the relief and the uh, the excitement it was just it was really a magical moment Opal is a psychiatric service dog so she's trained to help alert me to panic attacks and dissociative episodes she's also um, trained in non-protected boundary control so she can help give me that personal space and she's also really good at what she's doing right now, which is deep pressure therapy. Opal is going to come to uh, college with me in Texas. Having her in my life is just going to dramatically change the way that I go about being independent and um, can live my life freely as, as an adult. And so it's really amazing to have something that looks as cute as this and uh, serves such an important function. So I actually was in probably one of the worst states that I've been in and you know, it was kind of looking just like, what is there left to do? And to stumbled across, you know, psychiatric service dogs kind of on mistake. And it's just been one of the best mistakes I've made. And I'm very, very happy to have um, discovered something that can be so helpful, uh, especially since it's not, it's not so well known that, that they can help in this way. My hope for the future is that Julia and Opal will continue to grow and bond together and, you know, really form kind of a, a lifelong commitment towards, you know, mutual respect for each other and um, kind of develop a, re a relationship that can evolve into something that is kind of becomes a given so that Opal um, over time just becomes more of Julia's, you know, an, an extra appendage. Before I was placed with Opal, I think that I definitely went through frustrating times where, you know, the wait just seems like it's endless and it's just, it's never going to happen. And in these past few weeks, my perspective has completely changed because I've been able to see the other side of it and I see how much work has gone into this dog and just how perfect she is for me. And I don't know how they did it, but they found the perfect dog for me and that just helps me feel like the whole wait was totally worth it and, you know, I, that wait, in that time, I was waiting for, for my perfect dog. It's been really amazing how just having this dog around in the past um, week or so has, I just feel a complete sense of calm. And I just feel like this is the dog that is meant for me. And I, I can tell that she's so in tune with me. It feels like I can just breathe a little bit better because I know that she's there for me. And you know we're gonna work together to make sure that I can go about my day as smoothly as possible. And that's something that I really didn't have before, before I was placed with Opal, so it's very special. This is the heartbeat of Little Angel Service Dogs. We are a family who met as strangers, united in our goal to help disabled children and adults through incredible dogs. We are forever committed to our animals. We rescue dogs from shelters whenever we can. And when we must breed to produce excellent puppies, we do so with the utmost care, paying close attention to the health of our precious dogs. Loving families and individuals foster our dogs whenever possible. And when we must board our dogs in our kennels, we are dedicated to their enrichment, care, and happiness while they wait for their forever home. We never turn our back on a dog who should not be working as an assistance animal. Nearly 30% of our dogs would be better off as a pet or emotional support animal. 
we never return them to a shelter. We continue their training until they are prepared to be matched with the perfect family. We are committed to each and every dog in our care for life. We care for our recipients. We put the interests of others above our own. We believe all people should be treated with dignity and respect. In this broken world, we recognize that our recipients are people just like you and me who need compassion and a helping hand. Not only are we committed to our dogs for life, but to our recipients as well. We will never leave them or forsake them and will always remain available to support them through the years with their assistance dog. Our dogs give strength to families, enrich the lives of children, and provide independence to adults living with disabilities every day. We have led the way in actively training dogs to recognize and alert to seizures through scent. This has taken decades of research, relying on science, our knowledge of animal training, and the amazing abilities of canines. We help civilians and veterans alike, regardless of the source of trauma in their past. Our dogs keep children with autism safe and literally open doors for those with mobility impairments who cannot. We invest wisely and responsibly. Every dollar that is donated represents the love and care of our financial supporters, people just like you who want to work with us to provide a life change through these amazing dogs. We spend our money only where it is needed. A single puppy requires many skilled hands to raise and train it into a highly trained assistance dog who will help rather than hinder someone who is struggling with a disability. This requires years of labor, proper veterinary care, nutritious food, and training supplies. We do not waste our money on frivolous facilities that cost millions upon millions of dollars. Our dogs and recipients are kept comfortable at our peaceful ranches, rich with nature and love. We constantly seek and welcome volunteers to help us in our cause, which save funds while providing more loving hands to socialize our dogs. We are good stewards of the money entrusted to us. We spend wisely to directly and effectively impact and assist the disabled. Little Angel Service Dogs, together we are changing lives, one dog at a time.